Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Michael Lewis, journalist and best-selling author. His books include Liar's Poker, Moneyball, The Art of Winning an Unfair Game, and The Blind Side, Evolution of a Game. Michael, I'm a big fan of your work because you're often writing about economics, the trade-offs that decision makers make between different goals, given the costs of achieving those goals. And perhaps more importantly, you, you do something economists try to do, illuminate the hidden and the unseen. I want to start by talking about Moneyball, which is a wonderful read. In Moneyball, you tell the story of the Oakland Athletics, the Oakland A's, and their general manager, Billy Bean. At the time you wrote the book, Billy Bean saw some things that other general managers in baseball had trouble seeing. Tell us what made him so special. Well, uh, what, what he saw then now feels a bit dated, but at the time, we were talking 2000, I moved into his life in, um, in, in, two, in the 2002 two season. Um, uh, the Oakland A's were using statistical analysis really to the exclusion of other forms of evaluation uh, to judge baseball players. And uh, as Billy Bean said to me, I, 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 if I can't measure it, I don't invest in it. And if I can't quantify it, I don't invest in it. So um, the old way of evaluating baseball players was simply by looking at them. The scou- scouts, your scouts went out and looked at them, came back, made judgments, told you what to do. Uh, the A's were paying a lot less attention to their scouts than other front offices. The A's, instead, uh, what they'd done is, is um, avail themselves to really a body of R&D uh, that had been developed outside of baseball. I mean, they, they, for 20, 25 years uh, before that, um, there was a movement outside of baseball to essentially create new baseball knowledge and get to the bottom of of what makes a valuable baseball player and what's a smart baseball strategy. And um, and this body of knowledge, which was generated mainly by people who should have had a lot better things to do with their time, I mean, uh, statistic professors at universities and scient- research scientists at big corporations and, and just amateur geeks with, with personal computers, uh, they, they had used statistical analysis to, to really get at the guts of baseball. And Billy Bean uh, and his and his uh, uh, and his staff in the front office of the Oakland A's grabbed this stuff off the shelf and used it to to find uh, to, to find better ways to to evaluate baseball players. And they, the the main point though was that they didn't do this they they didn't do this unprompted. That the um, uh, it was it was because some years ago Billy had figured out that. If he didn't find a better way to, to put together a baseball team, he was doomed to lose because the Oakland A's would always be, be operating with less money than the competition. So they, they were prompted by that to kind of go find better ways to do it. Necessity is the mother of invention. Or as, as I like to think of it, when, when a man knows he's going to be hung in a fortnight, it concentrates the mind wonderfully, which I think is Samuel Johnson. So so under the the... the the stress of having to find a, a better way to do this, he turns to this research. Why do you think? Why do you think he trusted that stuff? I mean, I, I'm a big fan of it. It's work by people like Bill James and Pete Palmer that you're talking about, and others. As a fan of, and a, as an economist, I was always fascinated by the hypothesis testing and, and data driven approach that that those guys took. Why did Billy Bean, who was a former athlete, find that so compelling? Do you think? I think it had a lot to do with his personal experience. I mean, Billy had been um, uh, a first-round draft choice out of high school by the New York Mets, uh, and um, had been a, can't, a supposedly can't-miss prospect. He'd been on the receiving end of the intuitive judgments of the scouts, and the scouts all said this guy is going to be a future a future superstar, and um, and basically talked him out of going to college. He'd had a he had an offer of a scholar a free ride at Stanford, and he turned that down to sign with the Mets, and then proceeded to have 
what was really a disastrous baseball career. I mean, he made it to the big leagues, but he really was never any good. He wasn't suited to play the game. Uh, uh, and so having having experienced firsthand just how screwed up the subjective judgments of scouts could be, I think he was much more open to other ways of of, of, um, of valuing players and more objective ways of valuing players. Um, and he was, I think, and still is, slightly hostile to scouts. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- that's that was one reason. The other reason was um, they really were – when he took over the um, the AGM job in in 1997, they really were looking at larger and larger piles of cash in the opposing dugouts, and no sign of cash in there. They mm-hmm. really were at a huge disadvantage, and um, and so he was really kind of looking for any available weapon to compete. And one of the things that that he uh, learned from that literature, and one of the things that literature stresses which I love because it's hidden and unseen in a sense, is the ability to get on base. Right. Uh, The importance of on-base percentage, certainly relative to batting average, and on-base percentage for the non-baseball fans in the audience includes the ability to get on base via walk. It was the most important part of it. It includes a few other things. That was was one of the most important things. And so he was was looking for players – among other things, under, who are undervalued, but certainly on that dimension, correct? That's correct. And he, um, and um, it's now a cliche. I mean, in the last few years, since Moneyball has come out, on-base percentage has become very fashionable. In fact, um, Billy Bean would tell you that it's overpriced, and there's no point in trying to go buy it because other teams are trying to do it too. And uh, in fact, I think, um, I haven't seen it, but I've been told that there's an article in a recent um, uh, Journal of Economic Perspectives, I think it was called, uh, that 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 that, um, that asked this question: Was was um, before Moneyball was published, on, was on base percentage undervalued, and what's happened to it since? And the authors concluded that um, that it was, was indeed undervalued before 2002, and then when Moneyball came out, it actually was anything was overvalued. And, but this 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 skill I mean, to draw uh, uh, of drawing walks. Historically in baseball, wasn't viewed as a skill. It was, it was re- viewed as something really that the, the pitchers did, and the hitter had nothing to do with it. And, um, it, it, and if you just if you if you looked at the numbers, you could see that actually some players had an extraordinary ability to draw walks, and and that it had little to do with the pitchers. Uh, and the A's figured out that that on base percentage was the, the single most important uh, uh, statistic. In evaluating a hitter, and that it's the, uh, the on-base percentage was the most clor- close, closely correlated with the scoring of runs, and so since nobody else was valuing it, uh, they set out to go acquire players with high on-base percentages. And this meant, but it meant a particular kind of player with a high on-base percentage because if the player had had uh, really attractive conventional statistics, if he had a high batting average or hit lots of home runs, um, then he was likely to be properly valued already. They were looking for players who had just kind of ordinary batting averages and not conspicuous huge amounts of power, but who had the ability just to get themselves on the base because that because people weren't paying for that. Um, now, uh, since, since books come out uh, and since uh, Billy Bean's way of running a baseball team has been spreading through baseball, um, that's no longer a, a cheap asset. So they've been, they've actually see, as I said, they've ceased looking for it. And they have looking for other things and players that might be undervalued. But yes, that was what they were obsessed with when I when I moved into their lodge. So Billy Bean has to find uh, another arbitrage opportunity somewhere else if he can, which of course is getting harder and harder as his. Well, that's true. It is getting harder and harder. He would tell you. He would told you a year ago that the arbitrage opportunity is in valuing defensive ability in players. That. Um, he he feels that their models for valuing defense are superior to to uh, other people's, and that and so that that he he has built his teams out of that in the last couple of years. And his teams indeed look a lot different now than they looked five or six years ago. I mean, five or six years ago, the A's looked like a beer league softball team. Mm-hmm. They were a bunch of fat guys who walked a lot, right? Sluggers and and, uh, and and now they're kind of light and quick in the field, and they're offensively they're kind of indistinguished. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I, I'm fascinated by the defensive thing because unlike uh, on base percentage, 
you can at least observe a walk. It might be hard for you to pay attention to it. You might not know – it might not enter your consciousness, but – Defense, the traditional statistic is is fielding percentage, which Bill James, you know, in his early days, showed was not a very particularly valuable measure of of, of a player's defensive ability. Well, because because um, fielding percentage is just uh, really what you're measuring is the number of errors a player commits given the number of chances he has. But but to, <laughs> as James put out, to, to to commit an error, you have to get to the ball in the first place. That's right. And, that's, yeah. and so the the uh, which is which is which is a good thing, and uh, the, the easiest way to avoid committing errors is, is not to get to the ball. So yeah. if you, it, it, it makes real no, really no sense to, to stress errors in that way. But, but I mean, I tell you that, that even, when I, even three years ago uh, when I was with the A's, they had a, they were, they had a system in place that um, completely redid the accounting uh, uh, of a baseball game. So, um, so they could get at uh, defensive ability, range, and, and range back, ground range covered, back. and that's those right. Kind of and, and so they were already they already kind of knew uh, in 2002, 2003 that on base the game of find, finding cheap on base percentage was about to end, and that they were going to have to look elsewhere. It's interesting to see if that defensive those defensive measures are in some sense a little more proprietary. They're a little harder to copy. Noticing on base percentage, you can now find it in USA Today or anywhere on the web. But but getting a reliable measure of defensive ability is going to is a little going to be a little bit more of an art, presumably. A little bit more of an art. Also, the the uh, the it's um it's it's a less um it's less lucrative than on than on base percentage. I mean, the amount of time you have to spend and energy you have to put into right. getting uh, good defensive metrics uh, is greater and. The benefit to the team is smaller of, of 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 you know a slightly better defensive player than a than a slightly better offensive player. Right. And so um, so yeah, I think just generally the market's going to be slower to catch up to that. But but I think but I also think generally that uh, the market will and the A's in the long run are probably doomed yeah. because, because basically baseball has figured out that um, that. Objective analysis that that, that that using advanced uh, statistics to measure baseball players is not nonsense, but actually a, a shrewd way to invest to invest in them. Well, the paper you mentioned by uh, Skip Sauer of Clemson and John Hakes of uh, Albion College, and the we had Skip on a previous uh, podcast. I'll put links up to that podcast in the paper for this podcast as well. I want to come back to the point though that you alluded to from that paper. Which is that they found that in the late 20th century, which sounds ironic, weird, and strange to say, <laughs> but late 1990s, let's put it that way, uh, your book was correct. Billy Bean was correct. On base percentage was undervalued. It was an asset that was priced too low by the market. And that now, uh, 2004 and onward, after the book has come out, that that has been that so-called market imperfection has been corrected through competition raises a puzzle and it's a puzzle I thought about a lot when I read your book the first time why did Billy Bean give you such incredible access to what was essentially a remarkable trade secret he had knowledge that was extremely valuable the knowledge about the the productivity of this skill in baseball the ability to get on base and other things as well and he gave you access and let you write about it. Do you have any thoughts on why he did that? I do, and you know you have to look at it from his from from, from his perspective. He m- most of what the A's were doing, and uh, most of the knowledge they were drawing on uh, to build better baseball teams or build build their te- teams better teams more cheaply, uh, wasn't propi- proprietary. Most of it you could just get right off the web. So it wasn't. It wasn't the information uh, getting out that was the problem. Um, and if you ask, you know, I can remember when Billy when Billy first saw the book uh, in galley form, he was slightly miffed by how he'd been portrayed, and not at all concerned that I'd sort of written this blueprint that other teams might copy. 
And I asked him about his vanity, and he laughed. He said, you don't think people in baseball are really going to read your book? <laughs> and I think that he really thought that. Uh, that he, he, he really thought that, look, I've been sitting here exploiting this market inefficiency for the last six years, using information and tools that you can, anybody could grab off the Internet and use themselves. Uh, I've, other teams can see that what we're, what we're doing is superior, or they should be able to see it. We're, we're, we're generating wins much more cheaply than any other team in baseball, and yet they paid essentially no attention to what we're doing. Why would a book make any difference? Uh, I mean, I think he thought that that baseball management was so thick skulled that that no no book was really going to change the way they thought. Well, now, I... he was. I think he was wrong about that. Um, I did. I wasn't sure at the time. Now, in retrospect, I think he was completely wrong about it. The book has had an effect, and but it, but it was it was not the effect you might think. People who worked in baseball front offices didn't pick it up, read it, and say, "Oh, I was wrong. Right. I should have been. I should have been paying attention to what these A's were doing. Yes, they they've got a better way of doing it, and I'm going to emulate them now." That's not what happened. What happened was, um, uh, my, people who read other books of mine who say worked at Goldman Sachs picked up this thing. Uh, they were friends with the sort of people who own baseball teams. They called their friends, the, the owners of, of the New York Mets and the St. Louis Cardinals, and whoever, et cetera, et cetera, and said, you fool, those people you've hired to run your baseball teams are squandering your money. Read this book. And uh, I've had a, a number of reports where people calling me and saying, you never believe what just happened in our organization. Uh, you know, the, the owner just walked into the GM's office with a book and said, you read this or else. So the, it, the, the pressure to change came from ownership. Um, because they felt they felt let down by their management, and uh, so so um, I think. But to answer your question, I think Billy let me in because he didn't really see any downside. Uh, he, he couldn't. He didn't imagine that that um, that a book would change the way other uh, that, that other other teams saw him. And, That's and very what interesting. The A's were doing. Uh, so he was miffed at the fact that you showed how intensely he cared and. About losing and how difficult his personality was. Is what yeah, what, he, what upset him was, um, and not unjustifiably, is that I didn't care about him the whole person. That I wasn't writing a, uh, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't writing about how nice he was to his wife, right. and how he loved his daughter, and and I didn't write about anything about him outside of the context of his job. I was just describing how he was on the job, and how he is on the job is very intense. I was going to so, say, yeah, slightly so, intense. I will tell you, the feedback I got was that, was was reflected the way I wrote him. His wife thought um, I I made him look I, I made him out to be a monster. Mm-hmm. Uh, the players on the A's team thought I got him exactly as they knew him. <laughs> so so, so uh, you know it was just it was just the way he was on the job, and he was very intense. That's one of the most entertaining parts of the book. It's not necessarily the most educational parts of the book, but I cert- certainly enjoyed those uh, scenes. And I think anybody who's competitive and cares about their sports team saw, unfortunately, a little bit of themselves in those portraits. I'm sure that's right. Um, but he was right about one thing, I think, that the so-called baseball traditionalists, and I would include in that sportscasters uh, as well as some general managers, were – very disdainful of the um, the intellectual sophistication at the heart of Bean's method and your description of it, and very disdainful of the book. Uh, yeah, in fact, absolutely. A number of them, uh, having not read it, uh, assumed or forgot and attributed the authorship of the book to Bean and treated it as sort of a uh, fame-seeking exercise by him, ironic given how you tell us that his personal reaction to his portrait was taken, but uh, people like Joe Morgan and Harold Reynolds, uh, public popular. Now, for a while, I was in a very enviable position because the people who liked the book were, were people were, knew that I'd written it and and were nice to me. The people who hated the book thought Billy Bean had written it and were mean to him. <laughs> so so I didn't have to deal with any of the hostility. For a, it took about a year before anybody figured out that there was a, such a thing called an author. Yeah. And, that, and in fact, that he had nothing, that Billy Bean, I'm telling you, he had nothing to do with it. He, he had so little to do with it 
that until he read it, um, he was under the the impression that it was going to be a book that was kind of partly about them and partly about the Toronto Blue Jays and partly about the Boston Red Sox and maybe partly about the Texas Rangers. That he had no, he really didn't know how, what I was up to. And this is um, the misconception in baseball is just I think probably a misconception that's fairly common in sports when someone actually writes a a, a real book about sports because they're so used to seeing most sports books that cross their radar screen are um, are, are as told to. Right. Uh, and the, the, the hagiographies of one one form or another. And and so they, that was their frame of reference. So if there's a book in which Billy Bean is the main character, they assume that Billy Bean must have just controlled that book. Sure. Uh, but he really didn't have anything to do with it, other than, le- other than letting me into their lives. One aspect you don't talk about that I'd love to get your thoughts on is we talk about it a little bit, but uh, I think about it a lot is the relationship between uh, the general manager and the coach mm-hmm. and baseball. You know, some people say, uh, you know, the coach just writes out the lineup card and throws them out there and they hopes they do well. Some people attribute a sort of mad genius to people like Tony La Russa, mm-hmm. but they don't get the mad genius respect that Bill Walsh or Bill Belichick get in football. They clearly don't have the same role in strategic complexity. That's right. And in teams like Billy Beans or I think of Theo Epstein's as well, the managers – of those teams, in the case of the A's, Ken Maka and uh, and Terry Francona, appear to be uh, different than most coaches, most managers uh, of of the team, and appear to be more in the um, more subservient to the general manager than the usual manager perspective we get in baseball. Right. Is they, that is that true? Do you think? Is there anything to that? To what extent to Bean and and Epstein and others these these Folks who trust statistics. In what sense are they, you know, the puppeteers more than in a traditional general manager role, where they're basically picking the players and the manager does the actual strategic stuff? Um, I do think it's true. I mean, I think that, that on these teams that rely heavily on statistical analysis, that the statistical analysis, it, it, that the analysis of the of the players is not just of the players; it's also of the strategies. Um, uh, so the teams that are are sabermetrically inclined when they're deciding which players to hire are, are also going to be the teams that don't sacrifice bunt much and don't steal bases as much and so on and so forth. Right. That, 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 that the um, the method becomes a tool for the for the front office to intrude on what is traditionally the manager's turf, and the manager in those organizations is a much more recessive character, um, and. It's a, diff- a much more difficult job because the players quickly figure out that the manager doesn't have the same sort of power, clout that he had that he usually has, mm-hmm. and so it makes it harder for the manager to exert his authority over the players. Um, it, it's uh, so so it, so it is true. I think that uh, what compounds this problem is that just generally speaking in baseball. The manager is, he really has a lot less to do than a football coach. And it's a much easier job. It's more, it's more just kind of people managing. Sure. And if, if I put it another way, if you or I, um, were made the manager of the New York Yankees and it didn't cause social disruption, if people just were willing to accept us in that job, the New York Yankees would do Really well. Yeah, I, we'd, 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 I don't know if we'd win any fewer games than they actually than they than they would win otherwise. Uh, but if you or I were made uh, the head coach of of the New England Patriots, uh, it would be a disaster. Big trouble. It would be big trouble, <laughs> and and it wouldn't be because because of the social disruption. It would be because we actually didn't know what we were doing. And uh, be more and, be more of a scene like in Catch Me If You Can. You know, Leonardo DiCaprio is is. Uh, Surgeon, you know, nodding and saying to his coaches, "Well, what do you think? A cover two here, or maybe a <laughs> three, four, four, three, seven, two. What do you think?" <laughs> it would be there's um there is a lot more strategy yeah. to football than baseball, For and sure. it's more complicated. It's more a much more complicated sport. Um, so, um, although in the National League, of course, it does require a giant brain to figure out that double switch. You know, that's. <laughs> Uh, that always drives me nuts when people say, "Ah, oh, that National League is so sophisticated." Uh, 
but but the um, if you pointed out that that the book and me and Billy were at the receiving end of a lot of hostility in baseball and disdain and contempt, and that's true. And a big reason for this was that the book and Billy and the A's front office is very subversive of the traditional status structure, and it reduces the status of both the managers and all the scouts, and the managers, coaches, and scouts. And that, that's, the, that's the big population in baseball, and those are the people who talk to the press and the people who, um, whose voices are most heard. And so um, they didn't like it. Now, I can't really blame them for not liking it because sure. it's, it, it isn't a sweet message the book delivers to them. But I think it's true. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't have written if I didn't think yeah. that too. But, um, uh, but it does, it nevertheless causes friction. And, um, and it does, you know, it is this point, this point, there is a weakness that's caused, uh, it's an organizational weakness that's caused uh, by changing, uh, altering traditional status relationships. When you, when you uh, say that this manager has got to manage these 25 players, and then at the same time you basically geld him, and the players know that he's gelded. Makes it very hard for him to manage those players. I mean, it makes it very hard for for him to um, have any kind of effect on them at all. And so the job, the, that job um, in the A's organization or in the Red Sox is it, it's it's a harder job than than the the job traditionally has been, a less pleasant job. That's an interesting point. Uh, it's obvious in the Red Sox case, you know, when you have Manny Ramirez being Manny, and uh, Terry Francona shrugs through that in a way that would not be acceptable to quote a traditionalist, um, and it, it bugs a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, because it, it's different than what they're used to. Yeah. Um, no, change is tough. Change is. Um, but it's an interesting question. I there's a couple more things before I leave the baseball. Some people have argued that you know that sports is a Baseball is is inefficient, uh, and it and suggests that competition therefore isn't as powerful as you might think. My take on it, and I'd be curious to your reaction. My take on it is that baseball is competitive in a certain dimension, but because there's no entry, you can't just start a team on your own. You need a league. Uh, it allows these old boy networks and and traditional ways of doing things to persist far past what they might normally be in a more competitive. Business where there is entry and you can you can get you can really gain market share in baseball. It's a zero sum game. Uh, the teams... right, if baseball were an ordinary business, the Oakland A's would have acquired all the other teams and we'd be running those too. Correct, uh, uh, because they would found a better, a more efficient way to run those teams. Private equity firms would have come in and bought those teams. In fact, it's cut, even even with the club the, the, the barriers to entry. This is in effect what is happening in baseball. That that uh, most most of the new ownership comes in armed with an Oakland A's approach to to running the organization. Yeah, it's, it um, takes a little longer than it might in a regular industry, but it is. That's right. It's, it's inevitable. Well, it, it, but but you're, it is a really interesting question how these inefficiencies are become so embedded in a putatively competitive industry. Yeah, can you imagine uh, being a manufacturer and saying, you know, we don't like this sort of mechanization thing that seems to be a fad. We're just going to do things <laughs> the old-fashioned artisan way. And you can think that all you like, but you go out of business. But if you own the Kansas City Royals... You never you, go out of business. You can keep... Well, you, you can be close. You can, <laughs> but it's it's a lot harder because you've got all kinds of uh, ways of staying in business. Uh, it, you've got the only team in town. Uh, you do have competition from other sports. You have competition from other forms of entertainment, but you're the only baseball team for you know hundreds of miles. So it, it right. helps. That, well, that, and that that I think you're right. I think that does ex- at least partly explain um, why baseball is, was so slow to grab the new knowledge. Um, it having said that, I mean this is wandering a little bit far afield, but but wander um, freely. But but you know, I'm not sure that. I mean, it was it, it was really interesting to me the response to the book uh, that the last people to grab it and say this says something about our industry were baseball people, sure. but there were dozens of other industries 
where people said, my God, yeah, it's about baseball, but this describes our industry. Absolutely. And, um, and these are not industries that have huge barriers to entry. The movie business was, well, they had, there's some barriers to entry there, but, but, the, but the movie business was very quick to grab it. Wall Street was quick to grab it. Um, and so, so, um, it may be that, I mean, this is, um, I, I'm probably unqualified to have this opinion, <laughs> but, but, but um, I did feel when I was in the middle of uh, of working on Moneyball that this was um, uh, this was an example that behavioral economists would seize on and say, "Look, this is this is a, it's a, it, this is a really this really does show you that biases infect human judgment and and and." Uh, and supposedly competitive businesses, and there'll always be inefficiencies no matter how competitive it is. You know, it's a deep question. Uh, here at, at the economics department at George Mason University, I can tell you that there have been faculty meetings where people have advocated that we should follow the money ball approach, and I think we do. We do not follow the standard way of building an economics department. We look for undervalued assets, and particularly those assets, assets meaning professors, who we think are doing great work, but the profession, for whatever reason, is not valuing the way we think they should be valued. Well, that's really interesting because the profession is generally hostile to the idea that markets can be inefficient. Are they, are they, that's are they, correct, they, and, and this department is too. But <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, when you look at your own industry, you, you're doing it with the presumption that they're inefficiency. Correct, and that's a – well, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, – part of it's a, a, a semantic question of what you mean by inefficient. I right. think the – the university world is a very peculiar world, and and uh, it would probably be worthy of its own podcast. What I think is interesting is that is that most the part that I that I agree with is that it's very hard to step out of the mainstream. It's very hard. You know, just to take another example, um, economists have shown that that it's it's good to go for a two point conversion. That that, that it's good to go for it on fourth down in the right. sense that. Football coaches aren't risk don't take enough risks, right? And and the you know a standard explanation for why they don't is that well nobody else does and you'd be ridiculed and and the economist says on the other hand well but you'd win more games but the benefit but it's still a risk and the benefit of being right is, is small compared to the cost of being and, wrong and and you might not get enough draws from the urn of randomness right. to generate the returns that you need to show that it works out you right. have a tiny edge. Yes, if you go play long enough, you'll you'll make money. But you could just get a bad run, and then you're out. You're unemployed, and everybody thinks you're a fool. Everyone thinks you're a fool, and not just you're unemployed. You're unemployed in an industry where it's guaranteed, almost for certain, that there's only thirty or thirty-two job openings. There might somewhere down the road be thirty-three or thirty-four. But again, it's unlike in other other industries where, well, you know, if things catch on and expands. You know, I could get this the the Santa Fe uh, franchise or the the, the uh, Chattanooga franchise in, in Major League Sports, it's a very small game. Once you're in, the the, the temptation to be risk averse is very must be incredibly strong, which tells you that the people who do step outside the box, people like Billy Bean, and people like Bill Belichick, who goes you know who tr- goes for it on fourth down more often than the average coach, they are either have a very strong sense of self or something else is going on there. But they're, they're clearly different. That's true. Um, not to take anything away from Billy, but he would take it away from himself. He would tell you first that, in a funny way, they said he felt he had very little because cho- he wanted to win. Uh, he had very little choice but to find a bit different way of doing it. But in addition, and I think this is crucial to the Moneyball story, uh, that what they did, they did in Oakland, where no one paid any attention at all. If you try to do this, if you tried to innovate radically in Boston, be the first to, to do something. You'd be crucified by a very <laughs> loud and obnoxious media. Yeah, it's a, it's a vicious uh, and, environment and, there. And uh, and so to be in in a in a place where there is a, I mean, for all practical purposes, no no media at all, uh, and very very little in the way of of kind of criticism of whatever the front office is doing, is a huge advantage. That's a good point. Uh, before we leave this uh, the story, I want to add one more thing about the success of Moneyball outside of baseball. I think it's just so fascinating, as you point out. You think you think the people would have latched onto with the other general managers who would have, who would have who would have grabbed it and said, "Oh my goodness, I've been living my whole life incorrectly." Here's right. the truth. 
but it, I think part of the reason it, it was so compelling for others is the metaphor. And 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 uh, I don't mean to take anything away from the book, which is is really magnificent. But but the title and the idea of the book, the word Moneyball, is such a useful metaphor, and and the story that you tell is so memorable that it's a very nice way of communicating to people around you what you're talking about. You know, if you start talking about oh, there are these undervalued assets, I think a strategy that, or there's an arbitrage opportunity, it it's not as as compelling and memorable to people as Moneyball. And I just think it's a wonderful. Uh, I view it as a compliment. I hope you take it so. But. Well, I do. Uh, you know, there's there's always a, it's always a mystery when a book catches on, and it usually has a lot to do with things other than the book. And uh, it is true that that in in many many industries there is a, there's an equivalent kind of uh, uh, model or equ- equivalent kind of event uh, maybe waiting to happen. And the, and what the A's did gave offered a metaphor for it. You know, you mentioned the movie industry. Economists have looked at this, uh, and I don't know if it's true, but but the research on it, and it's both formal statistical research as well as I think casual uh, statistical uh, measures that that have been done by others. The movie industry supposedly doesn't make enough G-rated movies. Really? Yeah. No, the, the supposedly they make too many R's and not enough G's that the R's are the cutting edge, hipper, uh, w- whatever movies, but the G's make more money per, you know, per dollar invested. I don't know if it's really true, but it's uh, – and it raises the question as an economist, why wouldn't a new studio start up that would fix that? And of course, there is some, inter- there is some entry and there is some uh, – Evolution in the in the in the movie industry, but it appears to some, at least, that it's an unexploited profit opportunity, which economists are very surprised by. But I'm going to leave that. I just leave that on the table. I want to switch gears uh, for both our listeners and 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 you, and uh, I want to turn to your latest book. So deep breath. We're going to leave the diamond, the simple game, the little round white spheroid, the head to head drama of of pitcher and, and batter, and we're going to move to football. This is football season. We're taping this uh, a few days before the AFC and NFC uh, title games. And I want to turn to your latest book, The Blind Side, which is a just a, as much as I enjoyed Moneyball, I, in some senses, I, and as much as I like baseball, and in some sense I enjoyed The Blind Side even more. Uh, I would have read it in one sitting. It took me two, but it was it's a it's a tremendous You're read. You're forgiven. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, if you like uh, – the great thing about both books is you don't have to like baseball or football to, to enjoy them. But if you like either sport at all, they're, they're ex- just extraordinary reads. But particularly uh, the blind side, the, the human side of that story is just amazing. Uh, but in that book, a line in there I loved given our theme today of the hidden and the unseen, you say, what sets football apart from other sports – is that what you don't see is often the most important thing. So explain how that – the hidden aspect of the, the left tackle in that book. Uh, this is a good way of backing into how I ended up doing this book in, at all. Um, and let me, just, let me just start by explaining that because it grew out of Moneyball in a funny way. As I told you, the, 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 um, the, there was interest in Moneyball from every place but inside baseball. And one of the places that was really interested in Moneyball was other professional sports particularly basketball and, and football. And as a result of Moneyball, I found myself in several conversations with uh, NFL front offices who suspect that they have exactly the same problem, but harder to, uh, harder to measure. But the problem in, eva- a problem in evaluating um, uh, football talent, that mm-hmm. they're doing it subjectively and intuitively with, through their scouts' eyes and, and not measuring the right things. Um, but in these conversations, I just started to ask them sort of questions that I was asking Billy Bean: how you how you how you pay how you pay people, how you decide who's worth what, and got my hands on good uh, salary data, and discovered to my shock that the um, the left tackle on the offensive line had become the second highest paid person on the football field after the quarterback. That was shocking to me too, as a reader. I found that to be I mean, I, unbelievable. Blew me away. I mean, it shocked me that it was true, and two that I didn't know it. I mean, I would have thought that someone would have told me that because here you have 
a, a player who is basically everything he does is basically off camera. When you're watching a game on television, it's very seldom that you actually see what the left tackle is doing. And when you go to the game in the stadium, you naturally follow the ball, so you don't watch him there either, unless you make a real point of it. And it's very hard to do that because it means ignoring the ball. Um, and that, and this guy, I, I, you know, that it wasn't just that he was the second highest paid player on the field. He had that it had taken that this was a product of free agency. That if you went back to the period right before free agency. The left tackle's pay was indistinguishable from the pay of the other members of the offensive line, and that they were, uh, the low, as a group, the lowest paid players on the field. So there had been this enormous jump in his relative pay. And that interested me more than the, the even great, greater jump in, in, in pay for all football players, the, in absolute pay. I mean, it said that, that free agency had caused football teams to, to really think about the, the relative value of these players. And when they thought about it, or whether they were thinking it consciously or unconsciously, but when they had to actually make these decisions, uh, and a fine point was put on the decisions, they figured they, they figured that they reckoned that this one guy in the offensive line was just that was just that important. And um, so I was curious how that happened, uh, and it um, it it it, um, it touched on Moneyball themes because it really was all about how how a, a player gets valued. Um, but at, at roughly the same time I was having these conversations, I walked into this story in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, uh, then there's a story of Michael Orr. It was a kid who was at Vanna when I met him, uh, going into his junior year of high school, who had been identified as God's gift to left tackle. And he had had this, uh, he had had up to that point uh, a childhood that, to call it impoverished doesn't really do it justice. He was he was a poor black kid uh, who was going nowhere and in whom no real talent had been identified. Essentially homeless, not really going to school for effectively years. Yeah, effectively years. Living on the he street. Was essentially homeless. He was illiterate. Um, he had not even been identified as a, as a special as an especially important or gifted athlete. Uh, you know, he wasn't the running back or the quarterback. He wasn't. Uh, he he'd not played much in the way of organized football because he had not. He really hadn't had much organization at all in his life. I mean, to play organized football, you have to be in school, and um, and so. But but he was almost six foot six and three hundred and fifty pounds, and and on his high school football team that he was just joining, uh, about the quickest person in the ten yard dash. And he had lots of other little attributes, all of which added up to this ideal left tackle type. Um, and um, and I watched his value uh, be transformed. He went from being, you know, essentially the, 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 an unvalued human being to to close to to among the most highly prized seventeen year olds on, on the planet. And uh, hmm. and he and so these two stories. They obviously went together because what had made him so valuable was people that identified him as this rare beast, the perfect left tackle, who was all of a sudden a very expensive commodity in the NFL. But but um, it was also, th- th- these two stories seemed to rub up against each other because they were essentially, to, in my mind anyway, stories of, of, um, of social class. Uh, that Michael Orr had gone from being poor, black, illiterate, and... Uh, and, and, and homeless on the streets of Memphis to being adopted by a rich white Christian family uh, and drowned in nurture and essentially transposed from the lowest social class in Memphis to about the highest. And, the, and, the, and the, this move from one class to the other had enormous implications for him. Um, and, the, the, uh, and, it, and it kind of echoed this move that this, his position had made, that the left tackle had gone on the football field from being the lowest social class to very quietly the highest. And, um, and so the, 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 uh, the stories, to me, to me, rubbed together very neatly, and so I wrote them together. It, well, it's an incredibly poignant modern version of Pygmalion. It's, That's right. It's uh, really extraordinary. Now for, now, for our listeners who are not uh, football fans or even football experts, the the offensive line is a, basically a symmetric 
experience. There's a center who who's, who's hikes the ball to the quarterback, and he's flanked by two people, and those two people are flanked by two people, and the one on the far left is the left tackle. And on the surface, he appears exactly symmetrical, as you point out in the book, to the right tackle, and yet is paid mounds more. Right. And that paradox is, is beautifully explained. Tell well, us. Well, it's explained <clears throat> um, simply uh, because he's um, – that left tackle is protecting the the back of – of a right-handed quarterback when he goes back to pass. And almost block, all quarterbacks are right-handed. There are a few exceptions. Not all. But... Most quarterbacks are right-handed and in the NFL, and, and like most people are right-handed. And, they, and he, so he's protecting that quarterback's blind side. And a quarterback who's hit from behind or doesn't know what's coming from behind is, first place, a very jittery quarterback. And if he gets hit from behind, he's more likely to be injured and to fumble. And a lot of worse things are likely to happen from his back than his front. And... Um, and the passing game in the NFL has become steadily more important relative to the running game. Which is nicely the, documented in the book, very in well In the tried. last few decades. And uh, you can't win without it. And it's, uh, it, it's just become central to, to, to pro and big-time college football. And without that quarterback's blind side being protected, you don't have a passing game. And so the left tackle becomes the linchpin for uh, – for a football offense in a way the right tackle is not. Now, it raises, of course, the question, what happens when you have a left-handed quarterback? And, it's a little, so, and then the answer to that becomes a, a, a little more complicated uh, because the offensive line is actually usually not a completely symmetrical uh, uh, beast. That on the right side of the offense, because because most running backs are right-handed, mm-hmm. they tend to be, and hit, they tend to be more. Most teams run right; they're more comfortable running right than left, mm-hmm. and so they usually have an extra blocker over on that right side. So that right tackle Tight usually end. has more help uh, to block whatever's coming in at the quarterback from that side. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the and the other factor is because um, most quarterbacks are right-handed. And because the best thing a defense can do is hit that quarterback from behind, um, most of the most gifted uh, most of the most gifted pass rushers on the defense are lined up on that left uh, across from the left Correct. tackle. So the the right the right the guy on the right side of the offensive line usually isn't dealing with something quite as ferocious and dangerous as the guy on the left side, but. Um, that's a re- <clears throat> so it's a little messy when there's a when when there's a left-handed quarterback, but but basically the re- you know the reason that left tackle is paid more is that most quarterbacks are right-handed. Uh, having having become a uh, a little league coach in in recent years, one thing you learn when you think about sports in in any systematic way is the importance of shifting your weight, and you shift your weight. Uh, usually, the the correct way to do it in almost every sport is through your hips. Mm-hmm. So if you think about a golf swing, a baseball swing, uh, or throwing a football, you basically are going to be at right angles to where you want the thing to go, and at the end of it, you're going to be facing where you want it to go. So if right. you think about a baseball batter on the right hand, a right-handed baseball hitter faces uh, home the home plate, uh, the home team dugout. Mm-hmm. He doesn't face the pitcher, but by the time he finishes his swing, he is facing the pitcher. And the same is true with the a quarterback, a quarterback who's right-handed goes back to pass, and he faces the sideline, not downfield. But when he finishes his throw, by that hip movement that we're talking about, which generates power, That's right. he's going to end up facing. And so, I, so well, again, listeners who may not be football fans, that's why a right-handed quarterback has a blind side. He doesn't just drop back to pass facing where he's going to throw. He drops back to pass facing at 90-degree angle to where he's going to throw. And that's he right. then has a blind side from that other side. I'll t- I'll tell you that your book changed the way I watch football and the way I enjoyed it, uh, the way I enjoy it, and it's been a, it's a delightful. Uh, I'd never heard of, for example, Jonathan Ogden, who's the left tackle of the uh, Baltimore Ravens, and you paint an incredible picture of him in the book. And I enjoyed watching him this week and um, uh, playing Dwight Freeney, a once ferocious, not quite as ferocious as he once was, pass rusher, and uh, a number of plays that I point out to my kids. Uh, he's simply Pushed him down on the ground and laid down on top of him. <laughs> Which, because Jonathan Ogden is six foot nine, three hundred and fifty pounds, is not an ex- 
a pleasant experience to be on the other end of. And it, and in the past, when I he was he was a he had some injury issues coming into the game, and there was a question whether he would have played. And normally, as a f- casual fan, I would have said, "Oh, who's Jonathan Ogden? He's some lineman." But I knew from your book that without Jonathan Ogden, the, the Ravens would have been in in big trouble. Uh, they still were in trouble, as it turned out. But um, the the family you talk about in the book is rather extraordinary. The family that takes in uh, the the Michael Orr, uh, the the player, into their home. Uh, it, are they real, Michael? I, I know that I know they're real people. Uh, they come across really as as uh, other than their love for the University of Mississippi, which seems to perhaps affect their judgment from time to time. <laughs> they come across as as genuinely uh, uh, good people and remarkably good people. Well, to, you know, and and they are, um, but. I'm sus- I've always been suspicious of altruism, so I like to poke and prod it when I see it. Sure. And um, cynicism's healthy. And and it's uh and in their case, the family name is the Tuies. And um, what really drove their their relationship, the family's relationship with this destitute black kid who had showed up at their kid's school, uh, unable to read and write as a sophomore in high school, uh, was um, was the mother, Leanne Tuey. And what 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 you could there were two things that motivated her I think, um, and it wasn't an, it wasn't an abstract desire to be good. Um, the first thing was she she um, kind of accidentally encountered the boy encountered Michael very early on when he when he arrived, and and so and quickly saw a depth of need that she just had not experienced in her life. I mean, so she sees him um, the fir- Thanksgiving of their break of their fir- of the fir- of that first year he's at their Christian school, which would have been the last if she'd not taken him in hand because he really was not equipped to be there. Uh, but she sees him get off a city bus during Thanksgiving break in the middle of a snowstorm. He's wearing shorts and a T-shirt mm-hmm. and pulls over on the side road, asks him, what's he doing out in a short shorts and T-shirt in a snowstorm? And he says he's going to, to to sneak into the school gym because they got heat there. And she realizes this kid, he's in his shorts and t-shirt because that's all she has. And he's and he's more. What's worse, he's on the streets. Yeah. And and so she 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 takes him out to buy him some clothes so he's not cold. But then she realizes that not only is he cold and doesn't have any clothes, but he doesn't have any food to eat. And it, one thing leads to another, and she just she's answering these needs in a very human and natural way, and I think that if he hadn't been so needy, if he'd had some support system, their relationship would never have happened, uh, because she wouldn't have felt, she wouldn't have, she wouldn't have felt she was quite so necessary. The other thing that's fueling, that I think fueled her, her, um, the, the, the fan, her relationship with him was, um, she has a very, she and they are evangelical Christians, born again Christians, Though they don't like that phrase, um, and she has a very practical, hard bitten view of of Christianity. She's sort of there's sort of tests you pass to get into heaven, and either you're going or you're not, and you really don't want to not be going. And uh, and I, you know I I would I bothered her a lot about why she'd done what she'd done because it was so extraordinary. I mean, who takes in a six foot six inch, three hundred and fifty pound black kid who can't read or write at the age of fifteen when you have a daughter of the same age? You're rich and comfortable and happy on the across town in Memphis. It just seems like you're inviting problems, yeah. and uh, and yet she'd gone and done this. And I would ply her with glasses of Chardonnay and then ask her what on earth she thought she was doing. And and once she said to me, um, she once said to me, I think God gave us money to see how we'd handle it. She said God gives people money to see what they're going to do with it. And it's a kind of test. And what she meant by that is I'm a pass the test. <laughs> and the other thing she said, she said to me, she and that another on another occasion, she said, I think God created the race problem uh, to see how people would handle it, and and by God, I'm going to handle it well. So I mean, I don't think I mean it, it, it's it sounds a little extraordinary to say, but I think it's true. I think part of her was engaged in this uh, very practical act of getting herself into heaven. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh but that's the smaller part of her. The bigger part of her was she started taking care of this completely needy kid 
And as anybody who's taking care of anything knows, when you start really taking care of something, you grow to love it. Yeah. And uh, she grew to love him. And uh, and now, when you're with that family, uh, it's a bit of a strange experience because they went, they're together like they've been together their whole lives. He, Michael Orr fits into the Tui family as if he were born into it in every way except his appearance. It's an amazing, it's an amazing story. Amazing, but actually, when you think about it, not so amazing because what it really is is a story about um, the power of context and the the the, the power of, um, of of circumstance. It's the Pygmalion story, and um, an awful lot of social policy in this country has um, ghettoized poor people, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's a. Uh, it's exactly the opposite of the what this story suggests would be a more useful so- solution. That if you if you remove people from pathological situations and put them in healthy ones, it's amazing how quickly they adapt. And Michael Orr is, I mean, you talk about someone who society would have written off when you're 16 years old and you can't read or write, and you don't, and you you know that you don't know anybody who can read or write, right. and you don't know anybody who's got a job. No one in this family had ever had a driver's license. Um, it, that uh, you know, he's someone who is that that typically people would say, oh, it's too late. Right. If ten, we, if we got him 10 years ago. Uh, yes, he could have been saved, but he's 16 and it's too late. But even at 16, if you put him in a I mean, albeit an extraordinary circumstance where he can, where they have resources to provide him with, you know, kind of 24 hour tutors and all the rest. But nevertheless, um, four years later, he's a, he's a functioning student at the University of Mississippi who has just made the chancellor's list. The chancellor's list is one more selective than the dean's list. Mm. He's got a 3.9 grade point average at the University of Mississippi. And, when he sits down with you, if you were a fellow student at the University of Mississippi, the first thing he asks you is, "What's your grade point average?" Because he wants to compare his to yours. Hmm. I mean, it's just, it just. There are, you know, when I this story to me was so powerful because, in fact, having watched this story happen, um, I cannot look at at um, some poor inner city kid who's kind of dropping out of high school without thinking. If his circumstances were different, his life would turn out to be completely different. But this yeah. is not no, a matter a, of a character flaw no, it's, or it's, some innate flaw. It, it is really the hand. It, it, it's a kind of it's a kind of hand he was dealt, uh, and it's it's just so unfortunate that there that there aren't more people willing to sort of extract kids from bad situations, and that, that it is such an odd thing to do. No, it's an incredible, I think, uh, indictment of. What we've done to the education system, certainly in the inner city, and and lots of other things as well. But well, well, think about this. It's um, Michael Orr would have vanished without the Tuies. No one would have ever heard of him, and he would be either dead or in jail right now, and uh, almost certainly. And instead, he's on track. He's going to be a junior next year at Ole Miss, and the Tuies have agents and scouts and people calling them to say that. He is quite likely at the end of his junior year going to be a first round draft pick in the NFL. Uh, so he'll have a, a at left tackle you know, a, with a contract worth millions of dollars. And you, you imagine, uh, it, it's hard to imagine a more conspicuous, physically conspicuous athletic talent. Uh, he's 15 years old, wandering in the streets of inner city Memphis. And he's six foot five, three hundred fifty pounds, and he's got all the physical gifts of an NFL left tackle. If that person can be can have his value completely ignored by the world, you kind of wonder wh- whose value can't be ignored. And so he's a parable, I think. Well, there's a lot of truth to that, and it's another example of undervalued resources. I don't, I use that term in the technical sense, not the sense that people like to attribute to economists that we see human beings as inputs or some other thing. This is a very human story. Well, it, but you're trans- right. It links back to Moneyball. Yeah. It's because a, because it, it what hidden... Billy Bean and the Oakland A's front office is do, are doing are finding talents that have not been um, fully appreciated. Hidden so, gems. It, it's one thing to take um, – to appreciate Kevin Euclid, though, with the, of the Red Sox, who, who the A's coveted in your book, because he can walk a lot even though he doesn't look – 
like a much of an athlete, but this story is just the, the gap well, between is, what, right. This is a much more dramatic the, example, but the gap, I, but 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 just it is a much more dramatic example. But just to to beat this dead horse one more time, uh, um, Scott Hatterberg, who's a character in Moneyball, yep. um, will tell you that had the and who has had a a a, 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 a very productive last five five years of of, uh, of major league experience and is about to have a sixth since the A's picked him up off the off the refuse heap yep. uh, from from the Colorado Rockies, or actually from free agency, but he was basically going to be out of baseball. He'll tell you that if they hadn't recognized that his ability to get on base was valuable, he, he, if they hadn't been out there you know, look, finding a different way to value baseball players, his career would have been over. Yeah. Uh, and you don't think of these careers, these are professional athletic careers, of having these kind of huge arbitrary components to like that. You think of them having arbitrary health components, but... Uh, but you don't think of, you know, this uh, of players going by the wayside because people don't understand they're good. No, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, that's no, it's an incredible thing. But going back to the Tui's motivation, uh, the National uh, Collegiate Athletic Association, the NCAA, which is the organization that's responsible for running college sports, uh, they took a slightly different perspective. Uh, they raised the question, in, in which you tell in the book, they raised the question of whether the Tui's uh, treatment of Michael Orr was a way of influencing his decision to attend the to his alma mater, University of Mississippi, and uh, was therefore a violation of NCA regulations. And I'm going to give you um, – I'm going to read a quote from the book, which as an economist I found particularly compelling. Uh, it's a description of, of a price control, <clears throat> which is an issue we talk a lot about on these podcasts. Uh, in this case, a wage ceiling, a limit on what colleges can pay high school athletes. And here's what you wrote. The reason the NCAA needed investigators roaming the country to ensure that college football teams and their boosters weren't giving money or food or clothing or shelter or succor of any sort to the nation's best high school football players is that the nation's best high school football players were worth a lot more to the colleges than the tuition, room, and board they were allowed to pay them. The NCAA rules had created a black market and done for high school football what the Soviet police had once done for Levi's blue jeans. A market doesn't simply shut down when its goods become contraband. It just becomes more profitable for the people willing to operate in it. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the NCAA. And Did I get think... the economics wrong? No, you got it absolutely right, <laughs> which is, I mean, I college, I, I'd like to see um, college players paid at least, uh, or something done to change the way college sports is organized. We it's have this, insane, isn't it? Well, we have it's, this romance. It's, it's, you see coaches signing $40 million eight-year deals, and their players aren't allowed to take a dime. And they're not even allowed to take a job. If you're, if you're on scholarship, <laughs> if you're on an NCAA, if you're on a college football or college basketball Division One scholarship, you're not allowed to work while you're in school because, of course, correctly so, if this is what you care about, that is, if what you care about is limiting competition, if you took that job, it would be an opportunity to pad the pay as a way of bribing people to come to a particular school and rewarding them beyond what the the school is paying them right. legally. And it's a, I think it's a despicable thing. It's destructive of colleges too. It creates this bizarre romantic notion that, that we have student-athletes and, and the book I think does a remarkable job I'm puncturing, that, romantic puncturing that, that romance and I think correctly so. But I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, uh, it, it um, well first the, the specific charge leveled against the Tuies, which was which would have been comic if it had not been so seriously leveled. But the NCAA sent an investigator who spent two full days grilling the family and Michael Orr because the NCAA was terrified, as they 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 put it. They, they actually didn't say they were terrified, but what their concern was was that this was this was the latest the, the latest newest thing in. In uh, in SEC recruiting, that it was a way around the rules that white rich white booster families were going to go into the ghetto and adopt the, the 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 star athletes on behalf of the university because once they'd adopt them and made them family members, there was nothing the NCAA could do to prevent them from giving them money. <laughs> well, and, it, it could happen. It, stranger things have happened. I, well, that's true. I, I wouldn't blame I wouldn't blame the Tuies, but I suspect there'll be some. Just like folks imitated Billy Bean, I think there'll be some folks thinking that, hey, you know, this ain't a bad idea. idea. Yeah. You know, I, I'm sure you're right. 
uh, that will at least cross people's minds. Yep. I doubt it will cross their minds with left tackles, but <laughs> but but quarterbacks maybe. Yeah. But the the um, uh, so but but it just tells you something about how insane recruiting has become that this thought could have crossed the NCAA's mind that they're thinking these were their motives. They 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 adopted him, made him, put him in the will. The Tuies have the Tuies have a net worth of. Somewhere between twenty and fifty million dollars, depending on how Taco Bell is doing. They have a chain of Taco Bells. E. coli has put a little dent in their net worth, but uh, but the the uh, Michael Orr is he got a, a third share of that. So he he's been paid millions to go play left tackle for for Ole Miss. Um, anyway, um, I think that uh, the, the the specific charge was absurd. I they weren't thinking they weren't thinking like that and. But it was it was it was useful to me literarily because these investigators came in and asked questions that that I never would have had the nerve to ask, and I got to watch them try to answer these questions. And it was it was it was and they, and especially they were especially good at kind of teasing out of Michael his personal history, which even the Tuies were oblivious to. Uh, but but the the more general issue of. Um, the 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 romance of the student athlete the the kind of the hypocrisy of the student athlete I think this is a serious problem because um, this is a, in effect what the system does it forces lots of people to lie and pretend that the football players they're taking bringing in are actually qualified like every other student to be there and then they did this so that so each one of them has this infrastructure to maintain the fiction. That they are qualified to be there, so they usually aren't, they aren't doing their own, they aren't taking their own tests, they aren't doing their own homework to do because they couldn't, and uh, and they don't have time anyway because they're so busy practicing for football, and so they get them through the school, uh, and if they want to hang around for their piece of paper, they can hang around and get their piece of paper even, but they don't they don't learn anything, and it's quite possible uh, for these players to get through college without actually learning how to read, um, so. Uh, it doesn't do them a service uh, to 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 uh, to create this fiction, to maintain this fiction, and it, it has this all, this other side of side effect, uh, which is I think equally unpleasant, that the ones who aren't shrewd enough or canny enough or don't don't have the support system to to fool the system, yeah, uh, will get weeded out and not allowed to go to the college in the first place, and not have an easy way to get to the. Thing that they do best, which, which is, is play sports. pro football. And they got to do this sham thing, the of sham pretending. education, right? In order to get to the pro to the pros, and it's a free minor league system for the pros, so they like it. it well, saves them uh, on they the don't expenses. want to it's too much trouble for them to interfere with it, and so uh, and I think it's both a criminal. I think, that, and I, I don't say I think I think it's outrageous that some kid who happens to be born, say like Michael Orr was born, but without the help of the Tuies who actually is quite likely to have a very lucrative and successful pro football career, would have been prevented from doing so because a college wouldn't take him. Well, that's not his fault. Uh, and if it's, not, it's actually the fault of a public education system that failed him right from the get-go and a family that failed him right from the get-go. I agree. So um, it's almost as if the colleges are there partly to ensure that the failure that's created by dysfunctional families and dysfunctional public school systems, the kind of temporary failure that's created, it remains permanent, <laughs> and that, that the kid never gets out. And the, so so um, I think that um, uh, a healthier system would be one that sort of does away with the hypocrisy and says, yes, these players probably should be co- compensated, they should be paid. They should also, we should just accept that they aren't, Normal students, unless of course they want to be, uh, and but they can come even if they aren't normal students. And we will create a remedial program. It's all in the open. Yeah. If they can't read when they get here, we'll teach them how to read. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, but it's, we're not going to hide. We're not going to try to hide their problems. Uh, we're going to try to deal with them openly. And at the same time, they'll play football for our school, which we want them to do. And we'll have an opportunity if they're good at football to go on to the pros, even if they aren't scholars. Um, and uh, that would just seem to me to be, among other things, a much fairer way of dealing with uh, what in most, what in a lot of cases are poor uh, urban blacks who have started out in life with 
huge disadvantages. Well, what I hate about it is, besides the the sham aspect of it, is that this this the NCA regulations keep these kids from getting the benefits the competition would normally give them. But the competition still spills over. It just doesn't spill over into those salaries because they're against the rules. It spills over into the coach's salary, as you alluded to earlier. It spills over into other forms of competition, the building of absurd uh, weight rooms and, and gymnasiums and, and, and arenas sure. to, to lure kids, many of whom have no chance of ever playing in the pros but dream, which can you blame them? It's a lovely thing, and it's just so destructive. Every aspect of Big time college football is professionalized, except for <laughs> the pay of the people who play it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was in, I spent a summer in in Santiago, Chile, and all my friends, the Chileans who were uh, economists and others, their favorite team was the University of Chile, which is a team in the Chilean soccer league. And I said, "Why is it called the University of Chile?" I said, "Is it connected to the university?" No. You mean they're all professionals? Yeah. He said, he said, I said, why is it called that? They said, well, it's the intellectuals team. That's what we call it. That's what it got called. So it's perfect. They, have the, they, they pretend it's called that. It's what, I mean, it's what the University of Oklahoma already is, right? It's what the University of Alabama and, and other the, these football factories already are. They are professional teams. But in Chile, they don't pretend. They just, they just give it the name, and everybody's professional and paid a salary in competition with everybody else. Here well, we look, have this pretend if, if, thing. If the, the whole city of Oakland can identify with the Raiders simply because they're called the Oakland Raiders, exactly. schools are going to have no trouble <laughs> identifying with their football team yeah. if, they, if they're given the, the name and the colors of the school. Yeah, I think we'll get over it. I, I agree. Well, we're almost out of time. I want to I close with a, ask you another football question, if I could, slightly off subject, but it's slightly related. Uh, the New England Patriots are back in the in the final four of, of the NFL, and they've pursued a very um, hidden strategy, at least it seems to me, and I'd be curious to your reaction to it. They've let a lot of their glorious players go because they viewed them as overvalued, too expensive. This year they let Adam Vinatieri go, their, their incredible clutch kicker who took them to victory a number of times. Uh, they've let Ty Law and others go. They let their two best receivers go this year to replace them with cast-offs from other teams. They continue to win. Now, some say that's because Bill Belichick's a genius and Tom Brady's a you know a great quarterback. But I wonder, I think the strategy there, and people, I'm not making this up. It's not my insight. Uh, many have claimed that they understand that the 38th and 39th and 50th and 51st player on your roster are important. People get hurt during the year, and you've got to have depth. Do you think right. that's do you think that's true? Is is it really does that pay off there in your conversations with NFL folks? Do you think there's any truth to that? Because on the surface it looks like a disastrous strategy, and yet it seems to be working. Um, I, I, all I know is this: that even before I wrote Moneyball, the New England Patriots front office had a, a running dialogue with the Oakland A's front office. Really? Yes, and. <laughs> they were uh, Paul D. Podesta, who was the assistant general manager of the A's, was on very friendly terms with um, Scott Pioli. Scott Pioli, yeah, and who is uh, uh, in the front office of the Patriots. Yeah, and uh, so they were they were kindred spirits, hmm. and what they're doing is is has a, a similar surface appearance, um, n- n- not paying for stars. Uh, when a when a player becomes a star, uh, basically, and and is valued by the the market as a star, uh, go. going and finding some substitute, yeah. some cheap substitute, um, the the um, uh, and and uh, and being strategically uh, um, heretical. So Belichick is much more likely than just about every other coach in the NFL to go for it on fourth down. Yep. The, the exception is Parcells, who was his mentor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, I think that they are busy grinding numbers in interesting ways in their front office, but they're very opaque. The front offices, just in general, the NFL, are Kremlin-esque. Uh, they really think they've got secrets, even when most of them don't. (laughs) Uh, and I gather the Patriots are worse than most. So, um, Belichick, for example is notorious about lying about which players are hurt. Yep. 
uh, before games. Yep. He doesn't give an honest injury report. Yep. Um, and um, <laughs> so I don't – I they've never let me in. I don't know exactly what they're doing. But you're right. You look at it, and it, what they're doing appears to be a little different from what other people are doing. And uh, it's a combination of front office stuff and coaching stuff. Uh, well, we're, t- we're taping this uh, a couple weeks before the Super Bowl. You want to predict a winner? I think the Colts are going to beat the Patriots and go to the Super Bowl. And I think the Saints are going to beat the Bears. And I think the, um, the Saints are going to win the Super Bowl. Well, that'll be a lovely story. Uh, well, I'm from New Orleans, I should add. Yeah, well, I grew up in Boston, so I think the Patriots are going to handle the Colts. <laughs> and, in, in, and in ruining the Cinderella story, they're going to handle Reggie Bush. But we'll talk in two weeks, maybe. All right. Well, my guest today has been Michael Lewis, best-selling author. His most recent book is The Extraordinarily Entertaining, The Blind Side, Evolution of a Game. Michael, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.